In this video, I'm going to be talking about topic 8.7, persistent organic pollutants. We classify pollutants using a number of criteria. One of the most important, though, is how long it lasts in the environment. How long does the pollutant last before it naturally degrades? We use a number of other variables as well, including if the pollutant is synthetic or natural, how quickly it can spread out through air and water in the environment, how easily organisms can take it in, and what the effect it has on those organisms, and how toxic the pollutant is. The criterion that this video focuses on is persistence. A pollutant's persistence is a quantifiable measure of how long it's going to take for that pollutant to break down into harmless compounds. Therefore, it probably goes without saying that the longer lasting a pollutant is, the more potential it has to cause harm. We're going to be focusing specifically on organic pollutants, and so we classify these as persistent organic pollutants, or POPs. There are a number of different types of persistent organic pollutants, and some of them are, in fact, naturally occurring. They can be released by volcanic eruptions and even the result of some organisms' natural biochemical processes, but the vast majority of them are, in fact, human-made. Now, you're never going to be expected to have the structures or names of any of these pollutants memorized but you should be able to recognize a few features that are pretty consistent throughout each of these examples. One is that they are carbon-based. That's the organic part in persistent organic pollutants. Each of these is either a chain of carbon atoms linked together, or they form ring structures as well. Another common theme with persistent organic pollutants is the presence of halogens. So in this category here, we can see a bunch of chlorine. In this category here, we see bromine. And then in the ones down in the bottom, we see a lot of fluorine present. So persistent organic pollutants are, of course, carbon-based and oftentimes contain halogens as well. Some of these persistent organic pollutants can be formed unintentionally through combustion. When we incinerate waste, for example, when we burn backyard trash, which is more common in rural areas that don't have trash pickup services, and even as byproducts of some industrial processes. But the ones we're most concerned about are the ones that are intentionally manufactured. Persistent organic pollutants are used as flame retardants and oftentimes as pesticides. Insecticides are used to kill insects, herbicides to kill plants, and fungicides to kill fungi. One of the best known persistent organic pollutants is DDT. DDT was widely used as an insecticide after World War II. Thanks to the work of biologist Rachel Carson, who initially began studying the effects of DDT on the shells of bird's eggs, we now know through her work and her book called Silent Spring, that DDT had much farther reaching effects than originally thought. We're gonna take a look at a short video that explores DDT a little further. In 1943, the first six pounds of DDT arrived in the United States. It was tested by various government agencies and before the war was out, we were producing tons of it. Then after the war, the use of DDT expanded into agriculture, forestry, and uh, commercial and residential. It was used in hospitals. It was used everywhere. Uh, the peak year for its use was 1959, when there were 80 million pounds of DDT um, applied in the United States. So again, by the end of the 1950s, 1960s, DDT and a host of now other related insecticides that were chemically similar um, had come into really widespread use. In 1945, Rachel Carson learned that the Fish and Wildlife Service had been doing tests on DDT uh, at the Patuxent Research Center in Maryland, which is very near where she lived in Silver Spring. 
And um, these tests indicated that DDT maybe wasn't as harmless to other forms of life as had initially been thought. The presidential commission that Kennedy ordered, uh, as I mentioned earlier, essentially confirmed that Silent Spring was correct. It didn't really have any enforcement um, authority at that point, so not a lot changed at, at first. But Carson was asked to testify uh, uh, before the United States Senate. Biologist Rachel Carson, who also wrote The Sea Around Us, worked four years in the preparation of Silent Spring. What she wrote started a national quarrel. Chemicals are the sinister and little recognized partners of radiation in changing the very nature of the world, the very nature of its life. These sprays, dusts, and aerosols are now applied almost universally to farms, gardens, forests, and homes. Can anyone believe it is possible to lay down such a barrage of poisons on the surface of the earth without making it unfit for all life? They should not be called insecticides, but biocides. How organisms can be exposed to these pollutants varies, but generally food is a typical mode of exposure. There has been some research that suggests that inhalation of dust particles that have been contaminated with those pollutants is also possible. The fact that these pollutants are soluble in lipids means that they can be taken in by organisms very easily and they end up biomagnifying in organisms' fatty tissues. We're going to explore biomagnification and bioaccumulation in a later video. The effects of the pollutant varies depending on the pollutant itself, but some of the more common effects include disruption to the endocrine system and reproductive systems. DDT, for example, interferes with the way that testosterone functions. Uh, polychlorinated biphenols affect the way that the liver functions. Many of these pollutants are classified as carcinogens or cancer-causing. And in some cases, the effects of these pollutants can be synergistic. What synergistic means is that the negative consequences are greater than the sum of the pollutants individually. Thanks to the Stockholm Convention, there is an international system in place for the classification of persistent organic pollutants. It was first put in place by a division of the United Nations in 2001 and its purpose was to study what might be persistent organic pollutants and then ultimately classify them so that they could be tracked. A number of POPs have in fact been banned thanks to their recognition under the Stockholm Convention. Most nations have signed and ratified the Stockholm Convention with a couple of exceptions. The United States has signed the convention but the fact that it hasn't ratified it means that the U.S. doesn't need to adhere to its stipulations. Originally, 12 POPs were classified under the Stockholm Convention, including DDT and polychlorinated biphenols, but more recently, 10 more have been included on that list. Well, that does it for this video. Thanks for watching. See you next time.